It was the event of a generation, and it didn't even happen. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 craziest reveals from Netflix's Fire The Greatest Party That Never Happened and Hulu's Fire Fraud. And I realized that this is the best way to market my cram business. So I figured out the school's administrator password, and I started messing with them. I changed the password and like locked all the teachers out. So every time the Alpha Smart was turned on, it would say, for your broken crayons, basically come and find me. Before we begin, we publish new content every day. So be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. For this list, we're taking a look at the wildest moments and insane insights into this truly bizarre flop of a festival. We will be taking a deep dive into these highly acclaimed documentaries, so spoilers are inevitable. By the end of it, he's like, yeah, it was my vision the whole time. It was my idea, my vision to do this. Number 10, Firefest's looters. Some woman came in in a panic at one point in the dead of night. She couldn't find her friend. She was lost. She seemed like she was drunk. I mean, I, the, uh, but there's nothing you can do to help a person like that. You know, there's, it's, I don't know where I am either. If someone were to paint you a picture of a dimly lit campsite full of hungry young savages, your mind might jump to some of your favorite horror movies before you thought of the year's hottest music festival. We walked for 15 hours today. We ended up in the same place. There's no one here to help you. That's your motivation. But as seen in Netflix's documentary, this was not only the reality at fire, but it was actually worse than any of us could have imagined. We all heard the stories when news of the failed festival actually broke back in 2017, but no one could have guessed some of the things that many of the young looters ended up doing to survive, including raiding shipping containers full of other guests' luggage. One attendee even claimed that they witnessed their friend urinating around the campsite just to avoid having neighbors close by. Our strategy from there was to kind of ransack all the tents around us. We just started poking holes and flipping mattresses, and my buddy pissed on a few of the beds. Number nine. Comment censorship. Somebody would post a question on the thing, the question would immediately get deleted. Social media marketing has opened up a lot of doors for companies big and small, but Fire's tactics heading into their inaugural festival were just plain bizarre. After bombarding social media users with orange tiles and intriguing them enough to actually buy tickets to the festival, Firefest staff was dumbfounded when it came to answering all the incoming questions from thousands of ticket holders. On top of this, many skeptic accounts arose and began trying to spread the word as to the truth about the festival. It was almost like WikiLeaks. We were having these confidential meetings, and then things from that meeting were actually getting out word for word. Fire's response? Block any and all comments featuring negative buzzwords. And eventually, any and all buzzwords altogether. Number eight, lost keys. People were freaking out. No one had their room. No one knew where their bags were. It seemed that by the time the festival rolled around, everything that could have gone wrong already had. According to Fire Media founder Billy McFarland, there was a simple reason why festival attendees were forced to sleep in FEMA tents. It was all due to the fact that he'd misplaced the keys to the island villas that were previously promised to guests. We had a box of physical keys, cars to take people there, and maps for every single house. And the box of keys, uh, unfortunately, it went missing. There were supposedly around 250 luxury houses rented for the event, costing the festival up to $2 million. Whether this is factually true or not is still up in the air, but based on everything we know about McFarland up to this point, which side are you really on? So why didn't you tell that to the guests? Number seven, Kendall Jenner's Instagram post. I think 250 is a steal. To like post how many Instagrams? One. Both Fire Fraud and Fire the Greatest Party That Never Happened feature detailed deconstructions of influencer culture, and you cannot take on social media figures without a mention of one Kendall Jenner. Then Billy convinces Kendall Jenner, one of the largest influencers in the world, to post about the Fire Festival. Hulu's Fire Fraud notes that the model has been at the forefront of nearly every millennial movement, but few could have predicted just how much her voice is really worth. Dropping a figure of $250,000 for just one promotional post about Fire Festival, Hulu's film attributes much of the early ticket sales to models like Jenner and the impact that they can have. Who knew you could make that much money without even lifting a finger? Okay, maybe she lifted a couple thumbs. Kendall Jenner was paid, I think, $250,000 uh, by wire transfer just to post that one post. Number six, cashless wristbands. It just seemed like every day we'd wake up with an issue, solve it, 
by the next morning and then a new one would pop up and it was just playing this whack-a-mole game. The six-month production process of Fire Festival proved to be extremely expensive. And via the now infamous Billy McFarland, it did not go off without a few sketchy tricks from up his sleeve. After noticing a lack of funds of their own, Firefest emailed ticket holders explaining to them that it was mandatory to load up their festival wristbands with cash for the event. You load up the wristband with money, and then whenever you want to buy anything, you scan the wristband and it's debited from the account. The email even misled festival goers to believe that they'd need at least $300 per day, and that other attendees had added up to $3,000 on average to their accounts. Based on how the festival actually turned out, we're assuming the $800,000 the company reportedly accumulated through this initiative didn't really pay off. Billy wanted the engineers to set up payment through this RFID bracelet. And we all said that was insane based on the wireless communication issues. Number five, Escobar Island. This was Pablo Escobar's island uh, 25 years ago. So we're taking the dream for your average person in America or wherever they are and saying for three days you could become Pablo Escobar. Pablo Escobar might not be the first person you think of when you're dreaming of paradise, but Billy McFarlane clearly wants us all to think otherwise. Most likely banking off the success of Netflix's Narcos, the promo video for Fire Festival used the event's destination of Pablo Escobar's private island as a major selling point. They were told not to use the word Pablo Escobar, and then they used that in their first social media tweets. But it quickly turned out that Fire had spoken too soon, because their boasting of this fact saw them lose permission to use the island as a stage for the event in the first place. Instead, the festival was forced to relocate at the last minute to another island willing to host it, thereby failing to follow through on its promises once again. Then it went to another island, then it went to another island, until you finally got to Great Exuma, where it was like at least the biggest island in the Exuma, so it had, you know, plumbing. Number four, everything about Grant Margolin. While most people would watch the Hulu and Netflix documentaries and take note mostly of fire mastermind Billy McFarland, there's perhaps an equally interesting figure hiding just beneath the surface. Could we tell Herbie to have a big, 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 big bonfire tomorrow night, like a huge bonfire? Chief Marketing Officer Grant Margolin is described in Netflix's film as being an extremely neurotic character whose anxious demeanor is bizarre to watch. Flip over to Hulu's take on the guy and see him described in even more detail, including one story in which he reportedly penned a 1,000-word email to flesh out a potential musical score for the now infamous Fire Festival promo video. I want a use of odd meters and compounded time signatures. Global music elements. Extremely constant. He mentioned using a xylophone. A sudra, which is a Brazilian drum. Tico drum, especially during the more exploratory elements of the composition. Also, apparently, Margolin works as an EMT now, so there's that. I heard that Grant is now an EMT. His favorite word was urgent. If I, I had all caps urgent in my subject lines all the time, so now he actually has urgent situations. Number three, the caterer's financial troubles. I had 10 persons working directly with me just preparing food all day and all night. If both of these documentaries made you lose any and all faith you had left in humanity, then this story actually kind of had a happy ending. Netflix rounds off its film with shots showing the tears of caterer Mary Ann Roll, which became one of the most memorable images to come out of either documentary. Personally, I don't even like to talk about the fire festival. Just take it away mm -hmm. and just let me start a new beginning. Roll recounts the troubles that the failed festival brought to her and her country, both physically and financially, and she reveals how she was eventually forced to pay the overworked team that was brought on to help set up the event. After all was said and done, Roll paid out over $50,000 from her own pocket to cover all the wages. However, kind viewers around the world saw Roll down on her luck and raised over $170,000 to help pay off her debts. Number two, Billy McFarland post-Fire Festival. I'll never forget what he said to me. He looked me dead in my face and said, I'm not going to jail. I was like, this man either knows something that I don't, or he's certifiably insane. We'd love to say that once the Fire Festival debacle was done, Billy McFarland had learned his lesson and life went on. However, that is far from the case. After facing a class action lawsuit valued at $100 million and somehow making bail after a charge for wire fraud, McFarland emerged a free man. But he soon returned to his fraudulent ways as Fire Festival attendees began receiving emails promoting cheap, fraudulent tickets to in-demand events such as Coachella and Hamilton. And so I texted my friend Morgan, did you guys get this master's email? Yeah, I got that too. And so I'm like, okay, clearly somebody's targeting 
the Fire Festival email list. It was only a matter of time before Billy's name began emerging as the potential culprit. McFarland was eventually charged for the selling of fraudulent tickets on June 12, 2018, and then sentenced that October to six years in federal prison. As it turns out, NYC VIP was Billy. Before we unveil our number one pick, here are some dishonorable mentions. As we're like about to take off, he's like, yeah, I bought this plane like six months ago. I just got my license. I ended up teaching myself and, and you can use Microsoft Flight Simulator. Microsoft Flight Simulator has lessons and it's excellent. Once we were in the air, I was like, what are we going to do, you know? But I heard that some influencers actually got villas like mansions. Look at this kitchen! We actually did have a villa. We felt real bad. We did flat out lie to the public about what we we're giving them. I mean, that's fraud. Like, no. and that's not okay, like, no. as a company operates. No. That's not fraud. That's not fraud. That is, uh, I would call that, uh, false advertising. Number one, Andy takes one for the team. I went down. Well, Billy called me. I'm gonna speak completely, um, you know, this won't go that far, I'm sure, but. Billy called and said, Andy, we need you to take one big thing for the team. It's always good to be a team player, but maybe don't go quite as far as event producer Andy King, who almost went to extreme lengths to try and turn this already failing festival into a hit. According to the Netflix film, King found himself in a bizarre situation when the event's bottled water supply was held up at customs in the Bahamas. Head honcho Billy McFarland, that guy again, needed a quick solution. So according to King, Billy asked him to perform oral sex on a customs officer to free the water and I got into my car to drive across the island to take one for the team. After a quick shower and a rinse of mouthwash, King was actually on his way to the customs office, but was mercifully told that the water would be released with a payment being made at a later date. Nothing else required. <laughs> Can you imagine in my 30 years of a career that this is what I was going to do? I was going to do that, honestly, to save the festival. Do you agree with our picks? Check out these other great clips from WatchMojo. And be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.